Hello, good morning. Today is 11th of December 2013. This is Dr. G in the house. The topic for today is strangulodiasis or roundworm infection. Today we have a plan of our topic. We shall look at the definition or general information about the topic, the life cycle of roundworms, epidemiology, clinical features, diagnosis, treatment, and prophylaxis. Let's see our definition for today. Strangulodiasis, a human parasitic disease caused by roundworms, strangulodes, stercoalis. In immunocompromised people, e.g. HIV, strangulates can cause a hyperinfection syndrome that can lead to death if left untreated. That is to say, in these patients, because the immunity is uh, compromised, they normally face a problem of super infection because the immune system cannot defend itself against the infection. It was first described in France in 1876 by a French doctor who first saw the infection in human people of different ages. A uh, roundworm infection is a, a very complicated worm which can live in the human body for a long period of time. But let's discuss about the life cycle of the roundworm. Being a parasite, strangulates can undergo free living in the soil. That is to say, they have the ability to survive without a host. They can live in the soil alone without a host and can still cause infection to human beings. The larva form are passed through feces and transform into infectious flariform larva either directly or after free living phase of development because we said they can live freely in the soil so they have a free living phase before they reach the host. Human beings are infected after contact with contaminated soil and lava pass through the skin or mucous membranes or if you have a small wound the worm can easily penetrate to your body. They disseminate through blood, and through this process, through blood, we have worms to the blood circulation. So there's a possibility that these worms can reach the lungs. So when they get to the lungs through blood circulations, they break into the alveolus of the lungs, and they ascend through the bronchus, and when someone coughs, can still swallow the worms, and when they swallowed, they reach the the ileum or the GI tract. So from here, they can gain access to the small intestines, especially the duodenum. This is where they normally reside. And from this phase, the worms can continue to proliferate and reproduce and reach also the colon. But these worms are very stubborn. Sometimes they penetrate through the colon mucous in my brain and we should see the blood and when they get to the blood they continue to circulate within the circulation and cause more problems. Um, there is a continuous reproduction of these worms when they are inside the host that means they can still reproduce especially from the female. The eggs still get hatched because more larva which produce more and more worms inside the human being. This larva can, as we said, penetrate the colon, reach the blood circulation, which causes more internal reinfection. This allows strongulates to persist for decades within the human host. Uh, let's continue with our discussion and we we'll look at the Clinical before we look, look at the clinical features, let's first discuss about epidemiology. As we've been discussing in previous uh, tropical medicine, most these worms 
protozoans are common in tropical areas. But let's see how these roundworms are distributed in the world. They are most commonly distributed too in tropical areas like countries of Africa and by surprise in other humid countries like Asia, Brazil and other parts of South America. In the United States, the roundworms are normally distributed in the south part of America. United States, I mean the upper part, excepting the southern parts of Brazil, Paraguay and stuff like that. But we find them also in the United States itself. So do these worms, they are normally brought to the USA by the servicemen or the soldiers on trip mission, like to endemic areas like in Africa or other countries around the world. Let's check on the clinical features. The roundworms can live in a human being without showing any possible symptoms. That means they can live as a free living parasite within a human being with an uncomplicated forms. Patients normally present with an asymptomatic, so by accident, by doing stool culture, we can observe the worms. So, in mild forms, we normally observe mild abdominal symptoms, especially discomfort. Discomfort can be described as mild epigastric pain, especially when they involve the duodenum or duodenum. Dua, 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 part. And from this affection, the pain can be like ulcer. A patient will describe the pain as after eating or before eating. But the difference between the pain of ulcer and roundworm infection is that the peptic ulcer pain is evolved or exacerbated by eating food. Also, we see in the patients, they normally complain of eruption in the skin. It is called sapingenous eruption. On the skin, we have wounds where they, where they enter the mucous membrane. So they cause kind of ecteric kind of eruption, especially around the butt and the waist. So normally patients present with this complaint and we test them in our hospitals. Also, we can observe some dyspeptic syndrome like nausea, diarrhea, and most of all, we see malabsorption syndrome. Here comes malabsorption syndrome because patients present with a loss of weight and uh, because the worms are taking nutrients because they are affecting your small intestine where most nutrients are absorbed in the GIT. So people are really skinny. Also these worms can lead to intestinal obstruction. This is a common complication in our operation room where patients come with obstruction of small intestines due to worms. So we normally get them out and the patient gets better. As we discussed, these worms they reach the lungs pulmonary. So we uh, suspect pulmonary uh, symptoms like cough, discomfort in the chest and most of all it's common in complicated or disseminated phases of roundworm infection in immunocompromised patients. It can be confused to be like TB or cancer or any other problem. So about super infection this one we finished in immunocompromised patients like HIV, people receiving steroids and the cancer treatment chemotherapy, it's common. These worms can affect the central nervous system when they penetrate the blood brain barrier. So we normally find the symptoms of the nervous system like depression, agitation, confusion, and anxiety. These worms are so stubborn because they penetrate the mucous membrane. So there is a, a possibility of breaking down the mucus. So 
the microflora or the bacteria within the human organism can gain effect and reach the blood. So we see normally in our patients signs of bacteremia and signs of localized or disseminated sepsis due to these worms. Also in the blood we can see eosinophilia is prominent. So sometimes we can be mixed with other allergic reactions like bronchoasthma where we have eosinophils as predominating cells in the blood. Let's check on diagnostic measures of strangulites or roundworms. The most important material to examine in our laboratory is stool. Fresh stool is examined where we can see the large bones of the size of about 250 micrometers long with a short buccal cavity like a proboscis where they attach to the mucus so where they can suck out the, mu the nutrients. In un uncomplicated infections, few lovers can be passing stool, so there's a possible misdiagnosis or missing out. So we need as much more stool collections to get more uh, diagnostic measures for these worms. Also, there's a new uh, diagnostic measure called agar plate detection. It is 99% are sensitive to these worms, so we get the stool and observe. So we normally, even if in an uncomplicated form, we can get these worms in our stool culture. Also, we have developed a method of ELISA test. So we examine or we observe the antigens and antibodies of stranguloids or roundworms. In this case, normally for patients with in immunocompromised, it's the best method of diagnostic because in the previous stool and epigar, we may miss out the worms because these people, the immune system is very low, so we antibodies they can be missed. So the ELISA test help, helps us to get the picture of round worms. Also, pulmonary sy symptoms. We can examine sputum, broncholeavage, and other fluids from parts of the body. My dear friends, let's now look at the treatment and prophylaxis of round ones. To treat a pathogen, you must understand its causative pathways to the organism. We said these worms pass through contaminated soil to human beings. So we can think about prevention being better than cure. So here we can do routine examination of our people who come to the hospital. First of all, we can do individual testing, stool culturing and in hospitals, especially for patients in endemic or returning from endemic areas like tourists or soldiers on the trip mission. Treatment of choice, we have drugs. We can give tablets Avermectin, 250 milligrams per kilograms daily for two days. That dose can be effective in the treatment of complicated and uncomplicated forms of roundworms. Also in disseminated forms, we can use Avermectin for at least seven days. This helps to eradicate the parasites from the body. Also, we have albendazole tablets, 400 milligrams daily for three days. But using Ivermectin tablets, it's more effective than albendazole alone. So the treatment of choice will be Ivermectin tablets. Prophylaxis depends on the pathway of the pathogen to the organism. So let's look at hygiene. Put on shoes whenever you're going to, the, to dig or do farming work. Proper fecal hygiene, disposal sewage, so worms are passed through feces, so avoid contact with feces, boil water for drinking, and regular hospital visits. It's always better to prevent than to cure. 
Thank you so much for today. I'm coming back with Ebola in the next conference. Thank you so much.